So um, tonight we're going to start out with the constellations Volpecia and Lacerta. These are both northern constellations. They are usually visible. They are visible in the night sky from Tucson right now. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. When my keyboard decides to actually want to behave, oh boy, PowerPoint's not wanting to progress. Ugh, why does PowerPoint not want to work with Zoom? There we go. So Volpeca, Volpecula, excuse me, is the 55th uh, constellation in terms of size. So it's the 55th smallest constellation. It is a little bit larger than Ursa Major, the, the pole star and the Big Dipper. And it's not one of the original 44 constellations that was cataloged by Ptolemy uh, back in uh, ancient Greece. It is actually a slightly more recent constellation that was cataloged by a Polish astronomer uh, by Johannes Halevius. In fact, both Volpecia and Lacerta were, were cataloged and identified by Johannes. So Volpecia is short for, uh, is Latin for the word little fox, and uh, it contains one Messier object, one Caldwell object, and it has no stars brighter than fourth magnitude. So most of these stars are, you're not going to be, if you're within the Tucson light dome, you won't be able to see this constellation without a pair of binoculars or something more powerful. It has uh, at least six open clusters that are brighter than magnitude 10, so well within the range of uh, uh, any readily available telescope of, you know, good make. And it has three gal uh, galaxies that are dimmer than magnitude 10. So these galaxies are, are there. Uh, you might need a larger telescope, probably along the lines of a C10 or sorry, uh, a 10 inch Daub or a 10 inch McCass uh, to make good details of them within Tucson. If you're outside of Tucson, say at some of our darker sites like TAC, like CAC or Tempa, uh, you might be able to get away with seeing them with, a, with an eight inch telescope. Uh, it is intended to represent a fox that is carrying a goose to Cerberus, uh, one of the guard, the guard dog of the Greek underworld. Uh, and it was invented because, uh, uh, Halev is also invented uh, the corresponding Cerberus constellation that went along with uh, with Volpeca, uh, but we know that when, during the reorganization of all the constellations uh, in the early 20th century, Cerberus was struck from the list of official constellations, so we're left with Volpeca. Volpecula, uh, one of those two is going to be right eventually after this presentation. So here's uh, a rough diagram of I've. I don't remember exactly where this is from. This is from Wikipedia, but I, I know this is probably pulled from one of the older star atlases. Show, kind of showing where it is. So here we have Cygnus the Swan, and Volpeca is, Volpecula is right here off of the head of the swan towards the center of the summer triangle. And then our next con the constellation we'll talk about later tonight will be this one over here. This is Lacerta, and we will talk more about him after Volpeca, Volpecula. Ugh, one of those two. So if you're familiar with the summer triangle, you kind of already know where this is. It is an early summer to late fall constellation. Uh, it's visible in Tucson. Uh, I, I have the April here wrong. It's more like uh, May-ish. Um, so from May to, um, sorry, it starts being visible, excuse me, I'm misreading my own slides, uh, for starting in April, where early in the morning, uh, for more evening observers, it starts coming visible around July to August. Um, as I mentioned, it's kind of just off the head of the swan. And for those interested, the RA and deck coordinates are listed here. Find my mouse. So uh, a, a much larger star chart kind of showcasing where it is. So here we have Cygnus, we have Lyra and Vega, and Aquila down here. And Volpecula is right here, just off of the wing, more towards the center triangle. And uh, slightly, uh, our, for our good friend, Scantella Boba, Sky and Telescope, another star chart showing basically the same thing. Uh, it might be a little bit easier to make it out. There's not much in here. Uh, as you can kind of see, some of these stars, almost all of these stars that are on this chart are magnitude four from our gauge. Uh, so it's 
difficult to make out here in Tucson. This is a, a brief list of objects uh, I'm going to go over tonight for Volpecula, specifically the star Alpha Volpecula, uh, and two open clusters, uh, NGC 6885 and 64, 6940. Uh, the rest of these I'm not going to go over, mostly because uh, we, for time. And the galaxies here within the constellation aren't really are going to be really hard to make out with some amateur gear unless you're in really dark skies or have pretty big telescopes. So Alpha, Vul Alpha Vulpeculae is the brightest star in the constellation. It's about 650 light years away. It has a magnitude, apparent mag visual magnitude of about 4.4. .4, and it's about 500,000, uh, it has a luminosity of about 500,000, 5,000 times, way too much caffeine tonight, that of our sun. And it is about eight, eight times more massive than our own sun. It's classified as a red giant, and it is also an optical binary. So if you're a binocular person, you, you, you may be able to split the two stars together. So um, again, this is an optical binary, not a true binary. So the two stars that make up the binary system aren't in orbit around each other, like you would normally think with a binary. Uh, there's a second star that's just much farther behind uh, the primary star, which gives it the illusion that it's a binary system. So uh, here's kind of its position within the constellation on the left. And for those of you familiar with our Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, this is kind of where alphabetical peculae fits within uh, the overall star life cycle. So it's way over here in the red giant zone. It's also a very cool star. It's very reddish and very cool and, and temperature. Uh, it's very close to the tip of Cygnus. So if you find Cygnus, you can you should be able to readily find Alpha Heculae, assuming you don't confuse it with many of the other fourth magnitude stars within the constellation itself or within the constellation area itself. Uh, the next up on the list is the, uh, oh, I, I, lied. I, I said I was going to talk about two, maybe I'll have to look. Uh, the next object on our list is the uh, Messier 27, our good friend, the Dumbbell Nebula. If you, this is a planetary nebula, which is the remnant of a sun-like star that has progressed uh, to its white dwarf phase. And the surrounding nebula is the material that the star ejected from itself as it transitioned from a red giant into a white dwarf. It's about 1200 light twilight layers away and about magnitude eight. So you will need to see, a, you will need a telescope uh, to make out pretty, any significant detail within the nebula. And it's about eight arc minutes in diameter. It was cataloged in 1765 by Charles Messier. And for those interested in the coordinates, here they are for you. It, as you can see in the star chart, it's kind of, it's almost smack in the middle of the winter triangle. So here we have Vega, Deneb, and Altair. So M27 is almost right smack in the center of the summer triangle. Any questions so far? Uh, here is an I, an approximation of uh, a field of view simulation. This is done with a Smith Cassegrain, an eight-inch Smith Cass with a 2,000 millimeter focal length, using a 10 millimeter eyepiece uh, to kind of give you an idea of what type of eyepieces you would need to see the the object as a whole. Uh, here is a, a visual picture for those. Um, this is the one that I took uh, about 18 months ago. It's not exactly the best, but it kind of gives you some idea of what you might be looking at. It's a very small little cloud of gas and dust. Uh, so if you're, if you're looking through a lower powered uh, telescope, like a four inch refractor, uh, you may, it may be similar to what you're looking at, a very fuzzy dot and may confuse it for dust. So. Pretty easy. Uh, um, looks like my upstairs friends are having fun. Uh, next up on our list is Cot Caldwell 37. This is an open cluster about 2,000 light years away. It is magnitude six. So the 
uh, overall, the overall star cluster is within the length, the limits of human vision. Uh, you might not be able to see much of it though, like you would if you were looking at something like the beehive cluster or the, uh, the uh, Hyades cluster or the Perseids, uh, not the Perseids, the, excuse me, the Pleiades, which are readily visible um, open clusters in the night sky in the Northern Hemisphere. It is also cataloged as NGC 6885, and here are the RA deck coordinates, and here's its approximate position in the night sky. So again, kind of still off of Cygnus. It almost looks like it's more within Cygnus within Volpecula, but uh, it's officially cataloged within Volpecula. Uh, it does convenient, as we can kind of see from this image, it does lie uh, along the central dust band of the Milky Way. So that's what we're getting here at this image is a lot of the background dust from the central bulge, uh, the central spiral of the Milky Way galaxy itself. Again, this was done, this is uh, showcasing what the star cluster might look like on, a SMIC, on an aided, on an aided SMIC Cassegrain using a 10 millimeter eyepiece. So probably a little bit too much magnification for this. You might want to try it with a 25 or 35 millimeter eyepiece if you do have a, if you're having a telescope with a similar focal length. The next up, and I'm not sure if this is the last object, uh, is NGC 6940. This is also an open cluster of uh, uh, slightly below uh, 96.3, so slightly below human vision. It's uh, about uh, 24 arc minutes in diameter, so slightly smaller than the full moon, so a pretty, a pretty fair-sized open cluster in terms of apparent size. It's had about 2,500 light years away from us, and it was cataloged uh, by William Herschel, who cataloged much of the NGC, who, cre who created the majority of the NGC catalog in 1784. Uh, this is kind of a step back from the previous star cl uh, open cluster called with 37 where it said uh, I'm using a 25 millimeter eyepiece here for this simulation. So you can actually see a fair amount here of stars within this body with uh, at least some bright, brighter foreground stars to pull out both here, here, and a red star here in the center that's being covered up by uh, the crosshairs. Uh, so some pretty good detail. This is uh, uh, an okay uh, uh, out of focus picture, to be honest, of uh, of the same open cluster. Uh, so you, you get some fair amount of stars all throughout it. You can readily tell that you're looking at an open cluster compared to uh, just a normal star field. Any questions or comments about Bulpecula before we move on to Lacerta? Okay. Uh, so as we've kind of mentioned earlier, uh, Lacerta is also a northern constellation. Uh, it's visible here tonight in Tucson. It is the 68th uh, constellation. So it's actually on the smaller side. Uh, it's, uh, I'm trying to remember what it's smaller than. I think the constellation Ara is slightly, or, uh, is slightly larger than um, uh, Lacerta here. It was cataloged in the 1687, also by Johann Helovis, as I mentioned earlier. It is Latin for lizard and is sometimes referred to as little Cassiopeia. And we'll see why it kind of gets that name here in a second when I show you a star chart. It contains no Messier objects, one Caldwell object, six open clusters brighter than 10th magnitude, no galaxies brighter than 12th magnitude, so not much to look at here, uh, and a 12th magnitude planetary nebula. Uh, since this is also um, very like Volpecula and Cygnus, it does lie along the central bulge of the Milky Way. So the lack of decent galaxies here um, and uh, open cluster and globular clusters does make a certain amount of sense. You would find globular clusters more towards the, on the outer, um, outside of the galactic bands with the exception of a few more towards Sagittarius and uh, Scorpius. Uh, so again, it's, it's seeing this, recalling this image earlier, Lacerta is positioned right here behind the tail of the swan. That extends kind of out towards the wing as well. Uh, it is located, uh, uh, 
in the Southern Triangle region, found between Cassiopeia, Andromeda, and Cygnus. It is visible in Tucson uh, at reasonable hours from July to January. So here's where we get the name Little Cassiopeia from, because it basically is a, a zig the, the stars that make up the constellation asters in itself kind of just form a zigzag that does very much look like Cassiopeia, but with an extra arm down here, whereas Cassiopeia is more like a W-shaped, uh, we get an extra arm off of the constellation. Oh, that, ah, no, this button, go here. But again, here we have Cygnus over here to the right, Cassiopeia up here, and Andromeda, and Pegasus down here towards the bottom to kind of help orient where we are in the night sky. So you get different star chart kind of showcasing much the same thing. Uh, but with a different asterism, we get more, the sky and telescope decided to include more of a head and body on our lizard instead of the, the W, we still get the W shape here. So they added a couple more to the asterism. I'm not sure which one of these is the more official definition of the asterism itself. Like a lot of constellations, sometimes depending on what star charts you look at, people will add in extra elements or take away elements. Uh, a brief list of some of the objects just to kind of give an idea. So there are plenty of galaxies here. Uh, most of them are, as we kind of mentioned, well above magnitude 12. So requiring a fair bit of power on a telescope Damn. in order to make out anything really detailed about them. Uh, some decent open clusters here between magnitude six and magnitude nine. And you know your, your usual spattering of bright stars. Most of the you know, magnitude 3.8 or lower. So difficult to see within Tucson itself and good dark skies, uh, you can get a good view. Alpha Lacerta is the brightest star in the constellation uh, given the Vayner designation. It has no um, common name uh, like some of the other stars that you would. It's 102 light years away. It has a apparent magnitude of about 3.8. Uh, so definitely visual eye uh, objects, probably good binoculars. Um, it is about twice that, twice two solar masses compared to the sun, and it is about 28 times brighter than the sun. It is a blue-white main sequence star, so it's very hot, uh, burning through its hydrogen very quickly compared to some other stars, and it is also an optical double. So it's a blue-white a1 star, it's very kind of sitting over here in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. So for reference, our sun is somewhere around in this region here, near the center bottom of the HR diagram. So we're, we're way up there in both temperature and in mass. So it's a very bright star. Uh, I, uh, it's located more towards the head uh, probably more appropriate to say that it's filling in for the eye of the lizard. Uh, the next star we're going to talk about is uh, one that was just an interesting one to come across. It is a multi-component star system with five elements. So these are five stars that are all gravitationally bound together as a single star system, which um, was not something you, I, and past constellations we've come across very often. So I felt inclined to include it here just because it's uh, with five stars, with a five element star system, it makes you wonder how much longer they're going to be gravitationally bound together because there's uh, the, you would assume that some of the stars would interact and gravitationally eject other smaller stars or the larger stars from, from the system over time. So it makes you wonder, um, I couldn't find an age on this particular cluster, so it makes me think that this this star system is relatively young, uh, which is why the stars are still gravitationally bound together. It's about 700 light years away, and it has a spectral class of A1. I don't, um, the individual stars have varying magnitudes. All of these appear to be variable stars. 
So it's at ranging anywhere from magnitude six all the way to magnitude 12 to 14 in one case invisibility. So you will need a good telescope uh, probably to pull some of these out. Uh, there's another image I have coming up though, kind of show that. Uh, most of these are separated by less than half an arc minute in terms of angular separation. So they're all very close together. Uh, you would probably need, uh, I don't know, uh, probably like a, a, an eight inch with a good 10 millimeter eyepiece or something like that to make out almost all the stars, would be my best guess. So um, here's a star chart showing its position within the constellation. This is more towards the tail. So HP 901 is more towards the tail way down here. So let me move back a little bit. So we're looking somewhere. Sorry about this. Somewhere off the bottom right about in this area here for row 47. Um, also, if you're an SAO number person, this is the, the star's SAO number. If you want to punch that into your go-to telescope, it's 72446. Uh, this is kind of a, well, this, I'm not quite sure how um, the, the author managed to collect this picture, so I'm not, but this is a, another IP simulation of row 47. Uh, I, this was done with a F10 refractor uh, with a 10 millimeter eyepiece with 152 magnification. So this is uh, probably the equivalent of a C, uh, the six inch Schmidt Cassegrain, I think, in terms of focal length. Uh, so probably looking at something more like a C8 or a good or a good uh, Dobsonian to pull out some of the stars. Uh, over here on the right, we get a little bit better view of what the cluster of what the separation looks like. So all of these stars are fairly close together. So you'll need some pretty a pretty good eyepiece. And this person said that he eventually used a was using a six millimeter Palossal on the same six inch refractor to pull out uh, these two images to see the, the dimmer components of the star system. Next up is uh, Caldwell 16. This is an open cluster that is also cataloged as NGC 7243. It has a apparent magnitude of about 6.4, so slightly below human vision. And it has a, an apparent arc size of 21 arc minutes. So it's about two thirds the size of the full moon. It is about 2,600 light years distant. And uh, the RA and deck coordinates, if you care for that. Here is an IP simulation. This is, uh, again, the same eight inch Smith Cassegrain with a 25 millimeter eyepiece. And you can get basically the entire open cluster uh, within your field of view. This is uh, an image of the same open cluster. So there's a pretty good amount of stuff of, uh, of stars within this cluster. It's fairly, fairly packed. Much like what you would see with an, uh, uh, an open cluster, uh, more towards the galactic core, like uh, M7 or M20. No, M20 is globular, sorry. Uh, and I think this is the last object on our list. No, I have one more, I think. This is NGC 7209, also an open cluster. Uh, magnitude 7.7 .7 with a diameter of about 15 arc minutes. So one half the diameter of the full moon. It's almost 4,000 light years distant compared to, uh, so much farther than some of the open clusters we've already shown tonight. Uh, it's much more diffuse compared to uh, Caldwell 16, a uh, little bit more spread out, uh, a tighter core, with some sparse stars throughout. Again, 25 millimeter eyepiece on, eight in, on an eight inch Smith Cassegrain. Uh, kind of a more, so it's not, it's a very diffuse open cluster from what we can see here. We got some of these foreground stars taking up positions and then some nice clustering here uh, from the background stars. I'm not quite sure if these brighter stars here are foreground stars or part of the cluster itself. Images can always throw you off with that. Ah, so that was the last object. Any questions, comments? Cool. 
So I'm going to stop here with that. Um, if we want to take a, uh, we're going to keep powering on through. Uh, and we're going to move on to the main presentation here, which is on Johannes Kepler. You want to drive? Yeah, it's just easier that way. Okay. Less, less, just less, less you, less, less fiddling around with trying to get host permissions and then people figuring out Zoom and things like that. I need to not do this. When, okay, hopefully this will let me. Yeah. I hope the link works. There's an active link in here. I hope it works. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, if it doesn't. Well, uh, then I can always do it from my computer if I have to. Okay, so tonight I'm going to talk about um, Johannes Kepler. He's one of our more famous um, astronomy people in history. Um, Go ahead and go to the next slide. Is it is the slide progressing for you, Doug? Because I, no. I didn't move it. No. There it is. And a little bit lighter moment. No, go back one. Yeah. Two. All right. Is it is it back? If it's not, then I'll just. Exit full screen on PowerPoint and just do it like okay. I did last time. Yeah, a lighter moment for us astronomers who are cooped up. <laughs> How light imitates. <laughs> I love the picture on the bottom. Okay, let's move on. Uh, I did progress it. Uh, so are you? It's not there. Well, I'm gonna okay. So yeah, let me let me do this. Sorry, I just no problem. So Kepler was born basically around Christmas time, in the year 1571. He was born. Oops. Born, uh, pretty much near Stuttgart, Germany. The picture there on the slide shows his home. It's been turned into a museum now, which I'm sure is a museum of Kepler, Kepler Museum of some kind, um, located in his hometown. Uh, his father was a mercenary, and uh, that was a very honorable profession back then, but he didn't live very long as a mercenary. His father died young. His mother was a herbalist, healer, whatever you want to call her, doctor, I guess would be the closest thing in modern terms. Um, Kepler had two brothers and a sister. He was born premature and was said to be very sick looking and weak as a child, um, which I guess that was common back then. Children were often born premature and were often sick and they had a very high rate of uh, children dying at a young age. But Kepler did not die, obviously. By age five, he was already impressing visitors with his mathematical skills. He would, he would go to his grandfather's inn and he would sit there and entertain the visitors in the bar and the restaurant, it's an inn, with mathematical tricks and he would they would try to stump him with mathematical problems and he would solve them and he would earn a little money doing that. So he was a good mathematician even at age five. Next slide. Real quick, one thing I've always wondered is what's going to happen to Europe when they run out of houses because they turn them all to museums because <laughs> of famous people that lived in them. I don't know. <laughs> It'll become one just big museum. <laughs> I don't know. You're right, London is incredible like that. All right, so next slide, next slide. We're still waiting for it. Okay, so Kepler started out in astronomy at a very young age. Um, he developed a, a love for the science and that would go on basically for the rest of his life. At age six, 
um, his mother took him out to see the Great Comet of 1577. And um, at age nine, he witnessed a total lunar eclipse and noted how the moon turned red, which, you know, I guess that was, you know, you know that. Um, he had smallpox at a young age, which left him with weak vision and damaged his fingers and his hands, which kind of limited him in terms of being an observational astronomer, because he had a lot of hard time handling things like, uh, you know, the delicate optics and stuff of a, of a telescope. Um, or, or the instruments that they used. They didn't have telescopes yet. Galileo hadn't invented it yet. Um, but that would be a problem he would have with doing observational astronomy for the rest of his life, the smallpox damage. Next slide. There seems to be a bit of a delay here when you're telling me next slide and when it actually shows up. I know, that's okay. It takes as, as long as it takes. Um, Kepler had a very good education. He completed Latin school, he went to seminary, and then he attended the University of, I'm going to try to pronounce it right, Tübingen in Germany. That could be wrong. And that's a picture of that university. It still stands today. It's where he went to school. He proved himself to be an absolute superb mathematician, and he earned a reputation as an astrologer. Sorry, I know we hate that word, but that's how you made a living back then if you were into astronomy, is you did astrology, you gave horoscopes to fellow students or any rich people. He learned the Ptolemaic system, which is um, that the planets revolve around the earth and everything revolves, revolves around the earth, that's Ptolemy, and the Copernican system for planetary motion um, at the school. And that was when he became a Copernican, a firm believer in Copernicus. Um, in a student disputation, which I guess is the equivalent of a debate, um, he defended heliocentrism, which is the idea that the planets go around the sun and not the earth, from a theoretical and a theological perspective, maintaining that the sun was the most important power in the universe. Um, he wanted to become a minister, but because of his strong beliefs in Copernicus and other issues, um, he was not recommended to become a minister. Instead, he was re recommended to take a position as a teacher of mathematics and astronomy at a Protestant school in Graz, because um, Catholics, you know, they weren't very much in favor of the idea of Copernicus. Uh, so he took, he accepted the position at the age of 23 in uh, 1594. Next slide. Uh, was, since we're having some- Go ahead, did, did, Go ahead. So we had some delays with the with Zoom right now. Was anyone having a similar delay while I was giving the constellation of the month presentation? Yeah, we were. I was seeing that delay when you were trying to switch slides. Um, you would start talking about a slide before it came up. Was anyone else having a similar issue that way? Ne next time, I I I know to slow down in case there's some lag that others might be experiencing. I, I really didn't notice it. Okay. Didn't I didn't notice it. Nope. Okay. So it might just be Doug's internet connection then. <laughs> I guess that's possible. Sorry, Doug, um, you can continue. No problem. Um, so at Graz, he, you know, he's teaching mathematics and astronomy at Graz, but also this is where he started looking at um, thinking in terms of the geometrical plan of the universe that he's often known for. He started playing with uh, three-dimensional polyhedros, the, the, the five platonic solids, um, which are listed a little bit farther down, octahedron, icosahedron, dodecahedron, the tetrahedron, the cube, and he tried to fit them and then put spheres around them in such a way that the, the spheres would be 
at the right spacing for the planets. And, and he, he would work on this theory for a long time. Um, he also came up with a formula for relating the size of a planet's orbit to the length of its orbit orbital period. Um, he, his first theory, his first formula, if you like, was that it was the, the orbital period is twice the difference in the orbital radius. Um, he rejected that formula because it didn't work very well. Um, but this is where he started doing a lot of his research. It was at Graz. Go ahead, next. He published his first publication in 1596. It's called the Mysterium Cosmographicum. And this is where he published his, his ideas of the universe and put an extensive chapter talking about heliocentrism and tried to reconcile it with geocentrism in the Bible. Um, he was finally allowed to publish this work though after removing that chapter because the religious powers to be objected to that and insisted that he remove that chapter. Um, and he started sending this uh, paper, or book, I guess it's like a hundred and something pages, um, out to the prominent astronomers, including uh, Copernicus and Galileo and some of the other ones um, in 1597. It was not widely read, but it, it did establish Kepler as a very prominent mathematician and astronomer. Go ahead, next. <clears throat> he would change this paper many times, and later on he would re release a new version of it um, by trying to further, uh, uh, what do you call it? define the orbits better, uh, calculating the eccentricities of the planetary orbits and so forth. And he expanded and, and published a second version, uh, which was about half as long as the first one in 1621. Um, this paper, although it's still, um, it's, it's still using the geometry of those solids to define the orbits of the planets, is considered a major work. It's an important first step in um, updating Copernicus's theory uh, because here um, Kepler gets away from all the stuff that Ptolemy did to describe the uh, planetary orbits. Ptolemy used a lot of things like epicycles and eccentric circles and all kinds of funny things try to get the orbits of the planets to work out while still having them go around the earth. Um, and Copernicus, although obviously Copernicus believed that the planets went around the sun, he used a lot of the same devices that Ptolemy used to describe their orbits. And this, this work here by Kepler was really the first place where someone actually tried to get away from the Ptolemy stuff and come up with another idea of how to describe planetary orbits. So, um, I like the line at the bottom there. Um, it represents the first step in cleansing the Copernican system of the remnants of the Ptolemaic theory and so on. So, okay, next slide. So finally, around 1600, Kepler actually had a meeting and sat down with Tycho Brahe. They'd had communications by letters and, and they had read each other's works over the years. But finally, Kepler sat down and met with Tycho Brahe to work out some kind of an arrangement for the two of them to work together. Um, this was actually very hard for both of them to do. Kepler had no respect for Tycho, and Tycho absolutely detested Kepler. 
Um, but Tycho admired Kepler's math skills and Tycho realized he needed an, an outstanding mathematician to help him with his observations. Uh, so they finally reached an agreement regarding salary and living arrangements and everything else in June of 1600. Kepler went back to Graz to fetch his family. By this time, Kepler was married. He'd already had three children, but two of them had died as infants, so he only had one child left. And finally, in August in 1600, after refusing to convert to Catholicism, <laughs> Kepler was banished from Graz, <laughs> so Kepler and his family packed up and moved to Prague. <laughs> so once in Prague, Kepler worked very closely with Tycho. Tycho told Kepler on many occasions to study the Mars data, but was guarding that data so closely that Kepler never really had good access to the data um, while Tycho was alive. Two days after Tycho died, Kepler was appointed his successor as the imperial mathematician with the responsibility to complete Tycho's work. And so the next 11 years as imperial mathematician would be the most productive part of Kepler's life. Go ahead. So Kepler worked on a lot of things. He didn't just work on astronomy. Um, Kepler continued to analyze Mars data from Tycho's observations. Um, and now he had complete access to it since he was the imperial um, mathematician. But he also went into the field of optics and he did, he, he published an essay on optics in 1600. And he noted there were a lot of things unexplained in the field of optics, like lunar and sonar eclipses had weird things about them. Uh, the red color of the lunar eclipse, nobody understood that. Um, nobody understood what the funny light around the outside of the sun was during a solar eclipse. We now know that's the corona, but nobody knew that. Atmospheric refraction, um, nobody understood that. He started to investigate all of these issues. Um, in 1603, he actually stopped all his other work, including his work on the Mars data, to focus on optical theory. And he wrote a manuscript um, to the emperor um, that was published in 1604 called Astronomy Pars Optica, or the optical part of astronomy. And in it, Kepler just described a number of things that we take for granted today. Uh, for instance, he described the inverse square law governing how the light intensity falls off as the inverse square of the distance. Um, he talked about reflection by flat mirrors and curved mirrors. He developed the principle of the pinhole camera. Um, he talked about parallax and the apparent size of heavenly bodies. Um, he also looked at the human eye optics. Um, he um, is generally considered by most neuroscientists today as the first person to recognize that the images that are projected into your eye are inverted and reversed onto the retina in the back of the eye by the lens in the front of the eye. And he was the first one to actually um, figure that out. So he was a busy man, not in astronomy. And this, this uh, picture here is from that uh, optical part of astronomy manuscript. And I guess those are a bunch of eyes of different animals that he's got sketched out there. So, okay, so now he moved back into astronomy again and he finally published his next work. I'm sorry. Go ahead and yes, this one, I'm sorry. <laughs> He finally published a new uh, book called Astronomy Nova, or A New Astronomy, as it's called. And in this publication, he published his first two laws of planetary motion. Uh, he began with the analysis of Tycho of the Mars orbit 
and he calculated and recalculated various approximations uh, and eventually creating a model that agreed with Tycho's observations. Uh, but he wasn't satisfied with it, even though it was within two arc minutes of the observational data, which isn't bad. Um, he went back and did it again, and he started trying to fit an ovoid, and that didn't work. And But he, during all this investigation and all this research, he did come up with the idea that, well, the planets move slower when they're farther away, and they move faster when they're closer. And he said there's probably a mathematical relationship for that. Next slide. And finally, based on various measurements of Earth and Mars, uh, he created a formula in which the planet's rate of motion is inversely proportional to its distance. Um, and verifying the relationship, he came up with a calculation and he came up with the formulated proportion, blah, 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 in geometry. And he came up with the law, planets sweep out equal areas in equal times. That's his second law of planetary motion. It's interesting that he came up with the second law before the first law. Um, he published them in the same publication, but he actually figured out the second law before the first one. Um, as the next paragraph talks about, he then set about calculating the entire orbit of Mars and trying using that geometric rate law that he just calculated above, he started assuming an egg-shaped orbit and he tried like 40 times. And finally in 1604, he tried using an ellipse. And he had always, um, in the past, he had thought about using an ellipse before, but had thrown it away because he thought it was too simple. And he kept asking himself why earlier astronomers had never come up with that idea. Well, who knows? Anyway, so he came up with an ellipse and the elliptical orbit fit Mars. And he immediately concluded that all planets move in ellipses with the sun at one focus. That's his first law of planetary motion. Um, he didn't have any calculating assistance to help him. So he didn't go any farther than Mars. He just did the Mars work. Um, and he used the Mars work for the first two laws, basically. And um, he completed the manuscript for this work um, that year, 1603, I think it was, or 1604. Um, but it didn't get published in 1609 because there was a legal dispute over the use of Tycho's observations. Um, his heirs, Tycho's heirs, were fighting Kepler over the legal rights to those observations, even though Tycho's will had specified that Kepler would get them. And also as the imperial mathematician, um, he had complete access, but there was a legal dispute that went on for five years. Go ahead, next slide. Now, 1610 comes around and he hears about Galileo discovering the four satellites around Jupiter with his telescope. Um, Kepler immediately took up enthusiastic correspondence with Galileo, and they corresponded back and forth many times. Kepler also started his own experimental investigation with telescope optics, using a telescope that he had borrowed from somebody, and he wrote a manuscript about that in 1610. Um, in this manuscript, Kepler set out some theoretical ideas about how double convex lenses work, double con concave lenses, how they combine to produce the Galilean telescope. <coughs> and here he introduced the concept of a real image versus a virtual image, and the idea of upright versus inverted images, and the effects of focal length on magnification and reduction. So he was deep into the optics now, as soon as Galileo invented the telescope. And then he also described a new telescope, an improved telescope, 
which is commonly called the Keplerian telescope or the astronomical telescope. So he invented a new type of telescope to his benefit. A busy guy. Next slide. Um, so in 1611, he, <laughs> this is an interesting thing here, 1611 he publishes a book um, called The Dream. It was, it was published posthumously, but he circulated it in 1611. And this was basically um, a novel, if you like. Um, it described what practicing astronomy would be like from another planet. <laughs> um, described a trip to the moon and, and some and interplanetary travel. And this, this work actually is often referred to sometimes as the actual first science fiction piece written. Um, <coughs> unfortunately, it got terribly distorted. Uh, by getting passed from person to person and would eventually lead to his mother being tried as a witch. <laughs> because in the, in the book, the mother of the narrator of the book consults a demon to learn the means of space travel. And that was, you know, anything to do with demons was um, heresy back then. She would eventually be acquitted uh, thanks in no small part to uh, Kepler's very vigorous legal defense that he put on. Um, in 1611, he published another manuscript, um, just a short pamphlet, um, which was basically just, he studied snowflakes and described their hexagonal geometry and symmetry of snowflakes and included a discussion about the um, most efficient arrangement for packing spheres into a volume. And from what I understand, that work is still referenced today in, in various textbooks. Uh, next slide. Uh, real quick though, um, on the sphere packing problem, this was actually still an active area of current mathematical research but instead of packing in three dimensions, they've been trying to solve, how do I pack spheres in higher dimensional planes? Oh, <laughs> no, I so, obviously didn't know that, but I knew about the three dimensions. Yeah, I, I, I was reading an article here recently and they were trying to prove um, sphere packing in like planes of seven <laughs> and eight, like if you could arrange it, if you had like a seventh and eighth dimensional space. Interesting stuff if you're one of those people that likes blowing your head open with well, higher dimensional, Kepler with did. things greater than Kepler the third loved dimension. To do these weird but. things that had nothing to do with astronomy, like the hexagonal symmetry of snowflakes and the, and this kind of thing. And there's another one farther on that I find is really amusing that he did. But go ahead, next slide. Uh, 1611 turned out to be not a very good year for Kepler after the other things. Uh, things started to go bad politically. The uh, Emperor Rudolf, who had been supporting him very vigorously during all this time and while he worked with Tycho, um, had to abdicate. And the political climate changed to the point where Kepler had a very limited future in, <laughs> in, in Prague. Um, also in that year, his wife, contracted Hungarian spotted fever, and all three of his children got sick with smallpox, and one of them died. Um, he had had more children since the first three, um, but again, he loses another child. Um, so at this point, Kepler is starting to try to dig up more patrons at different locations to see if he can find another place to do his work. Um, He was sought after to be a mathematics professor um, at Padua, which I don't know where that is actually. Um, but I think that was in uh, somewhere 
in the, the uh, what do you call it? Like around Finland or Sweden or someplace like that. But he didn't want to go there. He wanted to stay in Germany. Um, so he moved to Austria and arranged a position as a teacher in the city of Linz. However, at that time, his wife lapsed into illness again and died. <sighs> so it's a bad year. Um, Kepler postponed his move to Linz and remained in Prague until Rudolf died, the, the old emperor that had, had uh, abdicated, died in early 1612. And at that point, he um, decided it was time to move. He, got, he was allowed to keep his position as the imperial mathematician to the new emperor, Matthias. Um, but he was allowed to move to Linz. So he moved to get away from all the political turmoil and probably from the family tragedy too. Next slide. Wow, okay. Um, so now he's in Lens, and his primary duties are teaching and providing this astrological and astronomical services. And um, here's where he wrote another interesting little piece um, called Novasterium, Delirium, whatever, on measuring the volume of containers such as wine barrels. He figured out how to measure the volume of different types of containers mathematically, which I mean, that piece is still used today. I know that. <laughs> and he published that in 1615. Um, in 1613, he marries again. He gets three more children. Two of them die in childhood. Uh, three more children he would get eventually, that would eventually survive into adulthood. <laughs> Life was tough then. You had diseases, plague, and everything else. So children, it was common for children to die young. Um, 1615, this woman who had a dispute with Kepler's brother decides to accuse Kepler's mother of being a witch. And uh, so, his, his mother was imprisoned for 14 months. And she was finally released in 1621 because they really didn't have any evidence. They just had rumors. And finally, with Kepler's help and a lot of other defense help, she was released. <laughs> Which trial on your mother because you wrote a book. Next slide. Throughout the trial, Kepler had dropped all his other work to focus on what he called his harmonic theory. Uh, it was finally published in 1690 uh, called Harmonices Mundi, Harmony of the World. Kepler was convinced that the geometrical things have provided the creator with a model for describing the whole world. So in this harmony book, he attempted to explain the proportions of the natural world, in particular astronomy and astrology things, in terms of music. And it is in the final portion of this work, book number five, where Kepler deals with the planetary motions. In particular, he talks about the relationships between orbital velocity and the orbital distance. Um, this these relationships have been talked about by other astronomers and physicists of the time, but not to the extent that Kepler did. And Kepler goes through this long uh, treatise on these motions and the relationship between velocity and the distance, and he comes up with what became known as Kepler's third law of planetary motion, that the square of the periodic times are to each other as the cubes of the mean distance. Um, 
he gives a date of when this, when he figured this out as March of 1618, but he really doesn't talk about how he came up with this in great deal. You get hints of it if you read his work about how he did it, but it's kind of not, it's glossed over a little bit in, in his work. Um, this third law of planetary motion has a great deal of significance um, because it's a purely mathematical and it's a purely kinematic law um, and it would not be, uh, the significance of it would not be realized until uh, people like uh, Isaac Newton and Edmund Haley and some other very famous uh, scientists at the time were able to use that law and uh, like Christian Huygens centripetal force law and you were able to use that to actually do calculations and it would eventually lead to Isaac Newton coming up with the theory of gravity in order to meet the conditions of his three laws. So it's very, the, the third law is extremely important in that sense. Go ahead, next slide. Um, so in 1623, Kepler at last completed what was called the Rudolphine Tables. This was the piece of work that Emperor Rudolph had, had originally consigned Tycho to do. And these were uh, star tables and planetary position tables that allowed you to plot the position of the planets and tables for many, many years and um, would allow astrologers and, and scientists to be able to do all their work very precisely. And um, this was the main work that Kepler was paid for when he was working. His other research was kind of on the side, but this was his main, this is what the emperor was paying him to work on. So finally, this did not, finally got published in 1627, because again, there was a holdup with Tycho Brahe's heirs, who probably wanted a piece of the money. Um, <coughs> during that time, you had the Thirty Years' War going on, and again, political pressures and all the violence that was going on in Europe at the time forced Kepler and his family to finally move again. Um, Kepler moved out of Linz and moved to the city of Alm and, and finally arranged for the printing of the tables at his own expense uh, because the tables, even though the Emperor Rudolf had won the tables, they were frowned on by the Catholic Church and were blocked from publication. And so Kepler had to do the publication himself basically at his own expense. Um, he eventually became an advisor to one of the generals of Emperor Ferdinand, and he would provide astronomical calculations and do horoscopes himself. Um, he spent a lot of time traveling in his final years around Europe, and uh, in Ruggensburg in 1630, he finally got sick and he died on November 15th. 1630 and he was buried there but interesting enough his burial site was lost when the Swedish army destroyed the church. No one knows where he's buried exactly. So, any questions on his story? I have more obviously but any questions on his life? Interesting life the guy had productive. Okay, next slide. So just, I'm going to go over Kepler's laws in as easy a fashion as I can. So his first law is just very simple. All the planets orbit the sun and ellipses with the sun at one of the foci points. An ellipse has two focus points. Um, and all this is saying is that the planet is in an ellipse and the sun's at one of the focus like the picture shows. So, and then his second law, next slide. Um, 
basically says that, you know, if you draw a line from a planet to the sun, it, that line sweeps out an equal area during an equal interval time. You, if you look at this picture, those two wedges, A1 and A2, are actually exactly the same size. And the period of time that it takes for the planet to take, to mark out that wedge, in this case, it's one month, the same period of time. So you have the same area in the same period of time. And that's the second law. Um, try the link. Oh, you've got to be, you've got to be in, um, oh, there it is. Okay. Not yet, but coming up, I hope. Is it going to work? Keep going. Wait, wait, wait. We'll get, hoping we get. You're about 30 seconds behind me. I've already made it a little bit bigger. The purple area, the purple triangle you see there, is going to be the same size as the planet goes around the sun. I'm just getting glimpses of it. I'm not getting the nice smooth motion. But this purple triangle is always the same size for the same amount of time. And I, the arrows represent different things. One of the arrows represents velocity, one of the arrows represents the force, and one of the arrows represents the acceleration. But you watch that purple triangle and it gets smaller and bigger. It looks like it's getting smaller and bigger, but it's really not. It's the same size. It's just getting stretched and compressed as it gets, as it goes around. Go ahead and close that, I think. Okay. Um, and then his third law, basically he said, the square of the orbital period of a planet is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of its orbit. So this is the formula you would look at here. And if you take T2 and R2 to be the Earth, T2 is the orbital period of the Earth in years, so it's one. R2 is the radius or the semi-major axis of the Earth's orbit in astronomical units, so that's one, okay, if you like. Uh, that makes the equation real simple. So if you plug in the numbers for Mars, for example, the uh, T2, the period of Mars's orbit, is um, 1.88 years, okay? And if you plug that in for T1 and you square it, you get 3.534. And then if you figure out what the cube root of 3.534 is, it's 1.523. So that should be the semi-major axis of the orbit for Mars. And I looked it up on Wikipedia, and the actual semi-major axis for the Martian orbit is 1.523. 679 astronomical units. And that's pretty good for something that was figured out 500 years ago. Any questions on the three laws? Okay. Um, so I think the legacy of Johannes Kepler is really great. I mean, he uh, I was surprised by how much work he did outside of astronomy and all the impressive stuff he did in optics and other fields that I knew nothing about until I did the research here. Um, he obviously had a huge influence on Newton because Newton had to develop uh, the theory of gravity, had to fit the three laws. It couldn't violate those laws per se because those laws are all based on observational information so any theory you come up with for what causes the planets to move that way, you can't break the laws because that's all based on solid observational data. So 
that was important. Um, but um, yeah, so I found Kepler to be a really interesting topic. Next slide. Obviously, Kepler has received honors all over the world. Countless number of stamps have been printed for Kepler. Coins in his honor, abundant. Um, statues all over the place. I think the statue on the top there, that picture on the top, is actually in the um, city of Linz. And then the statue on the bottom is actually one I showed a couple months ago when I did my presentation for Tycho, that statue is in uh, Prague. And that shows Kepler and Tycho together. Um, and there's statues all over Europe for Kepler. Everybody's got one. Um, next slide. And then, of course, there's a spacecraft named after him. The Kepler Observatory spacecraft was named after him. That's a unique honor. Not too many spacecraft are named after people. Next slide. And then, of course, perhaps the ultimate honor for an astronomer is to have a lunar crater named after you. So Kepler is actually one of the very prominent craters. It's, it's like the third biggest ray system on the near side of the moon. And you see Copernicus marked there and Tycho, and Kepler's right down there next to Copernicus. Very prominent crater. It's one of the easiest ones to find. You can find it with a pair of binoculars. That's a nice honor to have it named after you. And one more. And I don't know how many of you people have ever seen this mural. This mural is called Man in the Universe, and it used to be in the Flandreau Planetarium until not too long ago, recently. It is now hanging in the TCC. And there's Kepler outlined in the red circle. And basically, this is a really cool mural. If you ever get a chance to go look at it, go look at it. It goes through the whole history of astronomy from the ancient Greeks down in the lower left corner. Copernicus is there almost in the middle, just to the left of Kepler. Copernicus is on his deathbed. Galileo is behind him, and there's Kepler sitting right there in the circle. Tycho Brahe is standing behind Kepler. You see Isaac Newton there, and then over on the right, you see people like Hubble and Sandra Levitt and uh, other people in more recent astronomy, but this is an interesting mural to go through. But yeah, Kepler's in this one. So, okay, that's it. Any questions, comments, anything? Very informative, Doug. That was uh, nice. Yeah, thanks, Doug. Um, for next month, I'm going to need a little bit of help with content. I have two midterms. I'm actually going to just go ahead and stop the recording here, but it's still going.